The year was 1050. The aristocrat, Fujiwara no Narito, had just completed the long journey from the capital to the vast, far-off northern province of Mutsu to take office as its new governor. Mutsu was the back end of nowhere, a wild country of rolling mountains and dense forests inhabited by a people whose strange customs and peculiar dialects struck Narito as the very height of barbarity. Still, with its gold, its horses, and its exotic furs and feathers, Mutsu was a profitable place of assignment for a savvy bureaucrat, and if Narito had to spend the next four years in this uncultured backwater, well, he at least intended to be a much richer man by the time he left. When he arrived at the provincial headquarters, he was greeted by a procession of rough and tumble local landlords who would serve as his administrative assistants, and he was amused to find among their ranks another man bearing the surname of Fujiwara. The man introduced himself as Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo, a descendant of the renowned warrior Fujiwara no Hidesato, who had etched his name into history a century prior by putting down a great rebellion in the Kanto region to the south. So, you're from the Hidesato branch of the clan, are you? laughed Narito. You certainly know your way around a bow, but we still wonder where your ancestor dreamed up that dubious family tree of his. You ought to be grateful we even let you call yourselves Fujiwara. Unfazed by Narito's mockery, Tsunekiyo simply bowed his head and in a measured, warning tone responded, With all due respect, my lord, you're in Mutsu now. In this corner of the world, strength speaks a good deal louder than surnames. It was a message that Narito was destined to learn the hard way. Hello everyone, and welcome to the Buyuden Japanese History Channel. I hope you all enjoyed that little excerpt from my imaginary historical fiction novel about today's topic. I am not ever going to write that novel, but I am here today to fulfill the promise I made almost two years ago to make this video, in which I'm going to tell you the full story of two of the most important military conflicts in the history of Japan's samurai. The Zenkunen Kassen, or the former Nine Years' War, and the Gosannen Kassen, or the later Three Years' War. These wars took place in the mid to late 11th century CE, and were the culmination of a series of provincial conflicts which allowed several prominent aristocratic families to remold themselves as the sword arm of Japan's imperial court in the wake of the country's abolition of its conscripted standing army in the early years of the Heian period. Put simply, these wars capped off the phase of Japanese history in which the warrior stratum of society that we broadly refer to today as the samurai was born. The former Nine and later Three Years' Wars both took place in Japan's Tohoku region, the northernmost part of the main island of Honshu, which in this era was divided into two massive provinces called Mutsu and Dewa. In both conflicts, one of the country's most exalted ancient samurai clans, the Seiwa Minamoto, waged war against local power holders in these provinces, ostensibly in an effort to keep the peace and defend the imperial government, but in reality for what was probably the sake of personal gain. The earlier conflict, the former Nine Years' War, ran from 1051 to 1062, and witnessed a struggle between the warrior nobleman Minamoto no Yoriyoshi and a powerful family of Mutsu natives known as the Abe. The latter conflict, the later Three Years' War, ran from 1083 to 1087, and was a confrontation between Yoriyoshi's son and successor, Minamoto no Yoshie, and several factions of a Dewa-based clan called the Kiyohara. By the way, those of you who are paying close attention may have noticed that neither war's name matches its actual chronological length, and I plan on explaining that at the end of the video, so make sure to stick around if you're interested. The two wars are intimately connected, sharing several key characters and featuring various plot points that are introduced in the first, only to be concluded in the second, notwithstanding the fact that these were both real conflicts that brought pain and suffering upon hundreds, perhaps thousands, of actual human beings. They really do constitute an epic tale of historical drama, and given that nearly a millennium has elapsed since the actual events, I hope that we can all enjoy that drama without getting too depressed by the gory details. As I personally reside in the Tohoku region of Japan, this story is one that has always been very close to my heart, and so rather than just narrating it to you from this dusty little room like I usually do, I decided to actually go out and film this one on location. 
I'll be bringing you guys along with me to every single major location from the wars, so get ready for an adventure to parts of Japan that I'd wager have never been seen before on YouTube, at least on the English language side of the platform. Also get ready for lots and lots of cicada noises, cause as of the time that I'm filming this, it is early summer, and those little guys are out in force. Anyway, with all that being said, it's time to get into the video proper, and head to our first location. But before we catch up with Governor Narito and begin our tale, we need to take a few minutes to briefly establish a little backstory. As mentioned a moment ago, our story takes place in northern Japan, which was one of the last regions of the country to fall under the control of the emperor and the imperial court. During the 7th and 8th centuries, the court waged a series of campaigns aimed at conquering the region from its native inhabitants, a group of people which the court broadly referred to with the term emishi. While this word was likely used somewhat derisively on account of its nuance of barbarism, I will continue to use it occasionally throughout this video, as I don't really have a better alternative. By the dawn of the 9th century, the court's northern military campaigns had mostly come to an end, and while the region had not yet been totally stabilized, the provinces of Mutsu and Dewa were at least beginning to look a bit more like actual provinces. Still, given their distance from the capital and their population of culturally foreign inhabitants, the court initially governed them a bit like colonies, exercising their control via a network of fortified outposts like, for example, this one, Shiwa Castle, which was in use from 803 to 811. These forts served as centers of trade between northern and central Japan, and they were garrisoned with conscripted guardsmen who continued to be deployed there for a time even after the court abolished its standing army in most of the rest of the country. By the mid-10th century, however, Japan's Chinese-inspired bureaucratic style of government known as the Ritsuryo system was starting to collapse, leading these outposts to gradually fall out of use as the government began to manage its provinces in a far less hands-on manner. As the fortified outpost system fell into disrepair, trade between northern and central Japan began to be carried out by private individuals rather than through official state channels. These private individuals were often the provincial governors, known as Zuryo Kokushi, who had come to exercise absolute power out in the provinces during the mid Heian period, and many of these governorships were held by members of the military aristocracy, the legendary early samurai clans of the Seiwa Minamoto, the Kamu Taira, and the Hidesato Fujiwara. Because the trade goods sourced from the far north held a high level of demand while also being somewhat unreliable in supply thanks to coming from a far off and loosely ruled region, they were extremely valuable, meaning that they could not only be a source of vast wealth for Mutsu and Dewa's governors and their local collaborators, but also a potential trigger for internal disagreements and conflict. The region was particularly renowned for its supply of gold, animal furs, eagle feathers which were used in fletching top-of-the-line arrows, and first-rate horses raised on the region's abundance of bamboo grass. In order to carry out their gubernatorial duties as well as facilitate trade, the provincial governors of this era relied on wealthy and powerful locals to work under them and connect them to the local populace, and these people were more often than not the ones who actually kept the provincial government running on a day-to-day -day level. In Mutsu, one of these powerful local families indeed the most powerful of these families, was the Abe clan, who held sway over a group of six districts in Mutsu's Isawa region, known as the Okurokugun, or the Back Six Districts. Now, Japan's provinces had had these local district managers since the outset of the whole province system, but the 10th century had seen a mysterious change in the makeup of this layer of society across the entire country, with many powerful and ancient lineages disappearing from the pages of history, to be replaced by new clans who had built their wealth opening up new land on behalf of the provincial government. Both the Abe's heritage and the exact path which they followed in their rise to power are unclear, but they seem to have come to prominence at some point in this transitionary period between Japan's ancient and middle phases of history. According to the traditional narrative passed down through the centuries, the Abe were a clan of emishi chiefs who ruled over the villages under their jurisdiction as much by the authority of their exalted status in the local emishi society as by any authority granted to them by their official government position. This alleged identity is quite important because in the traditional telling of the former Nine Years' War, the Abe are very much the antagonists, and their status as emishi barbarians served to emphasize their villainhood to pre-modern audiences. 
In recent years, however, scholars have begun to suspect that the clan was paternally descended from a family of central aristocrats, as two generals dispatched to Mutsu during the 9th century bore the surname of Abe, Abe no Chikataka and Abe no Mitora. The question then becomes whether the Abe of Mutsu were descended from one of these men, or if they simply served under them as managers of local affairs and were granted the use of the name in the process. Much of the story of the former Nine Years' War comes down to us via a military epic called the Mutsuwaki, and it is this very document which describes the Abe as barbarian chiefs, but interestingly, this phrasing seems not to have existed in the earliest versions of the text. Moreover, in the diary of an aristocrat named Taira no Norikuni, the Abe patriarch a generation prior to our story is recorded as having been the Gon no Kami, or deputy governor of Mutsu, the second highest position in the provincial government structure and an office that it is difficult to imagine would have been granted to an emishi descended local chieftain. We will probably never know exactly where the Abe clan of Mutsu came from, but we should exercise a healthy degree of skepticism in regard to the simplistic pre-modern narrative, which may have sought to otherize them for the sake of convenience. Our story begins with the appointment of our friend from the intro, Fujiwara no Narito, to the position of governor of Mutsu in the year 1050 CE, a position which was headquartered here at Taga Castle. The anecdote about Narito being warned not to put too much stock in the power of his family name comes from a slightly sketchy old book that I own, and I have yet to verify its source, but if it did indeed take place, well, Narito does not seem to have taken the advice to heart. After assuming office, he immediately began seeking a head-on confrontation with the Abe, who had apparently angered him by attempting to extend their own personal authority outside of the back six districts. Narito was also unhappy with the Abe because they had been supposedly neglecting to forward on their district's tax revenue or supply workers for public labor projects, as all district managers were expected to do under Japan's government system. This was the era of Japanese history which was witnessing the explosive rise of the shōen, or private estate, tracts of land whose cultivators formed collusive bonds with central aristocrats or powerful temples in order to receive exemption from standard taxation. If the Abe were indeed shirking their tax duties, they were certainly not unique among the local provincial big shots of this era, but their lack of any alliance with a more powerful central benefactor left them easy targets for retribution by the imperial government. In no mood for compromise, Narito decided he would put the Abe back in their place by means of military force, although he was evidently uneasy enough about the prospect to enlist the aid of the deputy governor of Akita Castle in the neighboring Dewa province. The leader of the Abe clan, a man by the name of Abe no Yoritoki, responded by drawing up an army of his brethren and marching south to meet the governors, and the ensuing battle, called the Battle of Onikiribe, was apparently something of a bloodbath which saw the provincial government's forces badly defeated. Now, no location in northern Japan actually exists with the name of Onikiribe, but the battle is generally thought to have taken place here, a place called Onikobe, in what is the modern prefecture of Miyagi. That being said, some scholars suspect that this battle of Onikiribe is largely a work of fiction invented to stress the central government's claim that the Abe were nothing more than barbarian chiefs. For one, the name Onikiribe seems to have been intentionally contrived to conjure up strong images of a wild frontier region far off from the control of the imperial court, as the be suffix, also read as bu, was not a word that applied to any administrative jurisdiction of the provincial government apparatus and was rather seen in ancient Chinese writings as a term for foreign barbarian tribes and the regions they controlled. There's also just the simple fact that onikiri, literally meaning demon cutting, just sounds kind of barbarous and scary. Further reinforcing the theory of this battle's fictitiousness is the fact that it doesn't appear in any major historical chronicles of the time, which seems quite odd for a great battle waged by the combined forces of the governor of Mutsu and the governor of Akita Castle. Anyway, with all that said, it is still very likely that some kind of military confrontation occurred around this time between the Abe and the governor of Mutsu to kick off the former Nine Years' War. 
Following the battle of Onikiribe, or whatever real battle may have occurred in its place, Governor Narito, who seems to have had all the adventure he could handle, quickly hightailed it back to Kyoto to pass his problem on to someone better equipped for the task. After some deliberation, the imperial court chose to replace the traumatized Narito as governor with a more militarily formidable figure, and the man they chose for the job was none other than the Seiwa Minamoto clan's Minamoto no Yoriyoshi. Yoriyoshi had spent his early years in the capital serving one of the imperial princes, and he is recorded as having enjoyed impressing his aristocratic peers by appearing in archery exhibitions with a deliberately weakly strung bow with which he was able to still blow away the competition. When he was around 40, he and his father were dispatched out to the Kanto region to put down one of the great early samurai rebellions, the rebellion of Taira no Taratsune, and their success in this endeavor allowed the Minamoto to begin putting down roots in Japan's eastern backcountry. For his efforts, Yoriyoshi was appointed governor of Sagami province, and he went on to forge pseudo-lord vassal bonds with a great number of the lesser warrior clans of Kanto, who are said to have been practically tripping over one another to pledge their service to Yoriyoshi. By the time that Yoriyoshi was dispatched up to Mutsu to deal with the disobedient Abe, he was in his early 60s and had built up a formidable network of these Kanto-based followers to add to his family's pre-existing support base of warrior families from the central provinces around the capital. Should Yoriyoshi feel inclined to meet the Abe on the battlefield, he would have no shortage of well-trained fighters ready to flock to his banner and lay down their lives in support of his cause. Yoriyoshi was officially appointed to two key positions in Mutsu, the position of governor and the position of general of the province's main military base, the Pacification and Defense Headquarters, or Chinjufu in Japanese. During the early Heian period, the general of the Chinjufu had acted like a second governor in Mutsu, dividing up management of the province with the actual governor, and in particular, watching over the province's frontier from the fortification which once stood here, Isawa Castle. However, as this arrangement had often led to conflicts between the two offices over Mutsu's natural bounty, conflicts, by the way, which were often passed off as emishi rebellions by their participants, the leadership of the Chinjufu had gradually come to be an honorary post whose appointees just remained in Kyoto quietly collecting a paycheck. This de facto disappearance of the Chinjufu and its general is actually thought to be a large reason why the Abe clan was able to gain so much power in the back six districts, as this region had formerly been under the jurisdiction of the Chinjufu. With his dual appointment to the positions of both governor and Chinjufu general, Minamoto no Yoriyoshi would be the first recipient of the latter post in decades to actually make his way out to Mutsu. While the imperial court probably hoped that giving a renowned military man like Yoriyoshi both of the top leadership positions in the province would settle the disquieting state of affairs there before it got out of hand, for Yoriyoshi it was a prime opportunity to legitimately establish his own control over the lucrative back six districts, a goal whose achievement was made slightly difficult by the existence there of the Abe. For the Abe, Yoriyoshi's arrival in Mutsu was a worrying turn of events that would demand of them the utmost caution going forward, and, hoping to avoid a direct confrontation, Abe no Yoritoki displayed a consistently obedient and subservient attitude toward the new Minamoto governor for the next several years. Amusingly, and confusingly, Yoritoki's actual given name was Yoriyoshi, but he changed it to Yoritoki after his Minamoto counterpart's arrival as both a display of respect and a means of avoiding any weird misunderstandings. The Abe may have been willing to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with an amateur like Fujiwara no Narito, but they were far less eager to test the prowess of a seasoned battlefield pro like Minamoto no Yoriyoshi. Initially, the Abe's deferential attitude proved to be an effective means of avoiding conflict, with the first three years of Yoriyoshi's term passing uneventfully, and the fourth and final year, 1056, looking likely to do the same. Yoriyoshi, however, was not just another soft, docile aristocrat, and he wasn't about to end his term without poking the hornet's nest a bit to see if the Abe were really as non-threatening as they were presenting themselves to be. With only a few months remaining in his term as governor, he relocated his base of operations from Mutsu's provincial headquarters to the vicinity of the abandoned old Isawa castle, the old headquarters of the Chinjufu, putting him in much closer physical proximity to the Abe, and no doubt exerting a great deal of implicit pressure upon them. 
It was shortly after this that an event known as the Akurigawa or Akuri River incident would occur to destroy the peace that the Abe had worked so hard to maintain since Yoriyoshi's arrival. Yoriyoshi had allegedly wrapped up his business in the Isawa area and was on his way back south when a band of his subordinates were attacked by mysterious assailants at the Akuri River, with several men and horses being killed. The father of two of the men who had been attacked was also a follower of Yoriyoshi, and he insisted that the attackers had been led by Abeno Yoritoki's second son, Abeno Sarato. According to this follower, one Fujiwara no Tokisada, Abeno Sarato had requested his daughter's hand in marriage, but he and his sons had rejected this proposal on account of Sarato's barbarian heritage. Tokisada argued that Sarato had taken this rejection as an insult, which it was, and had attacked his son's unit in pursuit of revenge. Yoriyoshi ate this story up and quickly began making preparations to have Abe no Sarato arrested for these allegations. It was at this point that Abe no Yoritoki made the difficult choice to go to war with Yoriyoshi, as he had no intention of turning over his son for punishment. Before an assembly of his extended family, Yoritoki is said to have proclaimed, In this world, men stake everything on the feelings they have for their wives and children. We cannot permit the governor's unreasonable judgment to pass. Sarato may be a foolish son, but as his father, I cannot allow him to be executed. I would rather close the toll gate at Koromogawa and reject the governor's orders. If he comes to give us battle, then I have no qualms putting our clan's very existence on the line to beat him back. I would happily lay down my life for this fight. Yoritoki's family members agreed, and they closed down the roads leading into the back six districts. Infuriated at this insolence, Minamoto no Yoriyoshi called together warriors from the Kanto region and began preparing to take down the entire Abe clan by force. Now, it is strongly suspected that the Akuri River incident is fictional, and was conjured up by the author of the military epic about the former Nine Years' War to justify the Minamoto's aggressive actions against the Abe. There is no river in northern Japan called the Akuri River, and the name itself strongly resembles other fictional place names used in literary works of the time to refer to northern backcountry locations. In other words, while to us it may just sound like another Japanese word, to central aristocrats of the time it would have had a sort of wild frontierish ring to it. That being said, persuasive arguments have been made for the place where I sit now, a region of Kurihara City in Miyagi Prefecture which bears the similar sounding name of Akto, and sits just beside the Ichihasama River. Regardless of whether the Akuri River incident took place or not though, it is fairly certain that at some point during this year, the Minamoto invented some sort of trumped up accusations against Abe no Sarato to justify their beginning outright military actions against the Abe clan. In this same year, one of Abe no Yoritoki's daughters had given birth to a son with her husband, Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo, the gentleman from this video's intro who is said to have warned the former governor Narito to tread lightly in the north country. Tsunekiyo was a Minamoto vassal who had actually made his way out to Mutsu in the 1040s as a follower of Minamoto no Yoriyoshi's younger brother, Minamoto no Yorikiyo, who had served as governor of the province from 1040 to 1044. Tsunekiyo had put down roots in Mutsu, and gone so far as to marry into the Abe clan, and it is possible that this state of affairs had rankled Minamoto no Yoriyoshi slightly and acted as yet another factor pushing him towards wanting to wipe out the Abe. The newborn son of Tsunekiyo and his Abe wife was a boy named Fujiwara no Kiyohira, and he will play a major role in the second half of our story, so we would do well to make a mental note of his birth here. The Akuri River incident, conspiracy or not, was the point from which the former Nine Years' War would really take off, and it would rage on for the next seven years. For centuries, the incident was widely regarded as an example of the Abe clan's impertinence and disrespect for authority, but in modern times it is typically agreed to have been an intentional provocation by Yoriyoshi and the Minamoto. Yoriyoshi was ostensibly dispatched out to Mutsu to crack down on the Abe after their conflict with his predecessor, but having now come to the end of his term without any opportunity to engage in direct confrontation with them, he may have decided to force the issue a bit. 
It has also been suggested that this plot was hatched by some of Yoriyoshi's followers rather than Yoriyoshi himself, as they may have feared that once a new, non-warrior governor was appointed, the Abe would return to their high-handed ways, making it therefore essential that a confrontation happen now while Yoriyoshi was still around. As for the Abe, they were likely sick of being treated like second-class citizens by the steady stream of outsiders staffing the provincial governor's office, and with their patriarch's heir being labeled a criminal and in danger of execution, they decided it was time to stop playing nice. They had already given one governor a solid ass-kicking, and while this new one may have been a good deal more formidable reputation-wise, they still likely had every reason to believe that they had the upper hand if push came to shove. Within the ranks of Minamoto no Yoriyoshi's followers were two warriors who had actually married into the Abe family, the aforementioned Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo, who was at this point still tentatively being faithful to his Minamoto allegiance, and a fellow named Taira no Nagahira. As the Minamoto army advanced toward the back six districts, rumors began to swirl in the Minamoto camp that the latter, Nagahira, was secretly providing intelligence reports to his Abe in-laws, and when these rumors reached Yoriyoshi, he coldly chose to have Nagahira put to the sword. Witnessing this sequence of events, Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo naturally began to fear for his own life, and he hatched a plan to make a covert exit from the Minamoto army's ranks. Tsunekiyo utilized his reputation as being connected to the Abe to convince Yoriyoshi that part of the Abe army had slipped behind them and was actually intending to make a sneak attack on the provincial headquarters while it was undefended. Yoriyoshi believed this bit of false intel and left camp with several thousand men to hurry back south, and while the general was absent and the main army was well below full strength, Tsunekiyo led the several hundred warriors under his direct command out of the Minamoto camp with little fuss. Tsunekiyo then headed for the back six districts, where he linked up with his in-laws, the Abe, and pledged his loyalty to them, providing them with yet further advantage for the coming fight. With the situation looking dire, the imperial court at last chose to appoint Minamoto no Yoriyoshi to a second term as governor of Mutsu, and also presented him with an imperial decree for the destruction of the Abe. Realizing that a head-on confrontation with the invigorated Abe army would likely be reckless at this point, Minamoto no Yoriyoshi instead began working to secure the aid of a number of other, smaller local power holders in the regions nearby to the back six districts. One of these was a man by the name of Abe no Tomitada, whose relationship to the main Abe clan is not entirely clear, but who was apparently important enough to clan leader Abe no Yoritoki that he personally made the journey out to Tomitada's district to attempt to talk him out of siding with the Minamoto. Unfortunately for Yoritoki, he underestimated how thoroughly Tomitada had been won over to the Minamoto cause, and when he reached Tomitada's territory, he was ambushed by a small army of his warriors. Yoritoki, who was traveling with his own small contingent of warriors, managed to fight his way out of the trap, but in the process he was gravely wounded by a well-placed enemy arrow. It is unknown whether the arrow was poisoned or whether it simply struck a vital spot on Yoritoki's body, but either way, it was clear that the Abe chief's prognosis was grim. He and his warriors began hurrying back into Abe territory, evidently hoping to reach the clan's home base of the Koromogawa fortress, but just to hop and a skip away from their destination, at the nearby Tonomi fortress, Yoritoki's strength failed him, and he drew his final breath. Two months after receiving news of Yoritoki's death, in the 11th month of 1057, Minamoto no Yoriyoshi led some 1,800 warriors to meet the grieving Abe army in a pitched battle here, a place which was in those days called Kinomi, in the old district of Iwai. Yoriyoshi may have expected the Abe army's morale to be diminished after losing their leader, but he probably should have considered that winter is not the best season for waging war in northeastern Japan. The Battle of Kinomi was fought in the midst of heavy snow, which hampered the Minamoto army's maneuverability, and had left them and their horses drastically underfed in the days leading up to the battle. The Abe and their warriors, accustomed to the harsh winter conditions, dealt the Minamoto a crushing defeat, and Minamoto no Yoriyoshi and his son, Yoshie, are said to have escaped the killing field with a retinue of just six other warriors. For a brief period, it was not even clear to the other scattered survivors whether they had made it out alive at all, and a number of anecdotes remain about the sorrow and despair that racked the top Minamoto vassals in the days immediately following the battle. 
Ironically, it is thought to have been after this battle that Yoriyoshi at last received an official order from the imperial court to destroy the Abe, as up until this point, the court had been somewhat on the fence as to whether aggressive military action against them was really necessary. By trouncing the Minamoto army and inflicting heavy casualties upon them at Kinomi, the Abe had unintentionally sealed their own fate. Despite the embarrassing defeat, an undaunted Yoriyoshi was back to work attempting to make a renewed push against the Abe by the next month, but even with his shiny new imperial decree, the odds were looking less and less in his favor, and he was struggling to recruit warriors to replenish his ranks. Even the governor of the neighboring Dewa province made some excuse about not having official permission from the imperial court and declined Yoriyoshi's request for backup. The Abe began aggressively pushing south of the back six districts, sending their lieutenants from district to district collecting tax rice and making a point to issue private receipts for it rather than official government ones. The message was clear. Mutsu province no longer belongs to the governor. It belongs to the Abe. Still, Yoriyoshi refused to throw in the towel, and his followers seemed to have continued to have faith in him. In 1062, as Yoriyoshi's second term as governor approached its end, the new governor-to-be made his way up to Mutsu from Kyoto to relieve Yoriyoshi of his duties. However, this new governor, who was your standard fair capital aristocrat, found that no one in the provincial governor's office would even give him the time of day, instead preferring to act as though Yoriyoshi was still their boss. Realizing the pointlessness of even trying to assert himself in the face of these rugged frontier warriors, the poor man is said to have turned around and headed right back to the capital. Having failed in his attempt to directly confront the Abe in the field, Yoriyoshi realized that his best bet was the strategy which had allowed him to indirectly kill Abe no Yoritoki in the first place, finding more powerful allies to throw against the Abe from within northern Japan. The family which Yoriyoshi set his sights on this time was the Kiyohara clan of Dewa province to the west, and after relentless, persistent entreaties, a high-ranking member of the family, Kiyohara no Takenori, at last agreed to join the war on the side of the Minamoto. This was a massive win for Yoriyoshi, as the Kiyohara were to Dewa what the Abe were to Mutsu, and while the warriors under Yoriyoshi's command at this time numbered only a few thousand, Kiyohara no Takenori would bring to the table an additional 10,000 men, quadrupling the size of the anti-Abe army. Yoriyoshi seems to have pulled out all the stops to bring Takenori over to his side, not only making numerous personal pleas, but also getting the imperial court heavily involved in the persuasion process. At Yoriyoshi's urging, Takenori received an official imperial order to join in the fighting, in addition to being granted a relatively prestigious court rank, and also likely being given official authority to mobilize many of the other notable warrior families of Dewa province. Another factor which may have influenced Takenori's decision is the fact that relations between the Kiyohara and the Abe had gotten slightly awkward in the wake of clan leader Abe no Yoritoki's death. You see, after Yoritoki's passing, leadership of the Abe had been taken over by Yoritoki's aforementioned second son, Abe no Sadato, who was not technically his father's official heir, but had risen to the occasion thanks to his charisma and popularity within the extended Abe clan. The man Sadato had pushed to the sidelines to assume clan leadership was his younger half-brother, Muneto, the son of Yoritoki and his highest-ranking wife, who was, you guessed it, a daughter of the Kiyohara clan. By Muneto being denied his birthright, the entire Kiyohara clan had effectively been insulted, and there's a good chance that this influenced Kiyohara no Takenori's decision to march out against the Sadato-led Abe. It is worth noting that Muneto himself does not seem to have been too upset about the situation, as he consistently fought for his family throughout the entire war without making any attempts at betrayal or rebellion. With the Kiyohara on his side and a massively expanded host under his command, Yuriyoshi began his final campaign to wrest control of the back six districts away from the Abe. Initially, things went well with the Kiyohara Minamoto army attacking and capturing the Abe-controlled Komatsu fortress in Iwai district. From here, however, things began to get a bit more dicey as heavy rains stalled the army's advance and thus depleted their provisions, and local civilians moving under the orders of the Abe harassed their supply chain. 
Yuriyoshi dispatched about a quarter of his army off to raid local rice fields for food, and the Abe shrewdly chose this opportunity to launch an attack on the main Minamoto camp with an army of about 8,000. Numerically, the battle was roughly equally matched, and the veteran Minamoto warriors shook in their boots at once again facing this foe who had had them and their leader on the ropes for the last half decade. But the fresh Kiyohara contingent gleefully plunged into the fray, eager to get a shot at their eastern counterparts. After the dust settled on what is said to have been a six-hour battle lasting from noon till dusk, it was the Abe who were left running for the hills as the Kiyohara and Minamoto warriors cut down stragglers or forced them to plunge desperately into the Iwai River. Wanting to give the beaten Abe no chance to catch their breath, the Kiyohara Minamoto army quickly went on the march again, assaulting the Abe's camp in the middle of the night and routing them there, and then continuing to viciously nip at their heels as they fled further north. The exhausted Abe hurried into one of their most stalwart strongholds in the area, the Koromogawa Fortress, which is said to have been located at the spot where I'm speaking to you from now. They hoped that the fortress's impregnability would finally bring their foes to a screeching halt, but unfortunately, this plan too would not play out the way they were hoping. Kiyohara no Takenori sent a small party of his most trusted warriors to launch a sneak attack on one of the stronghold's nearby satellite forts and set it on fire, and the unexpected blaze rattled the soldiers of the main Abe army so much that they despaired and gave up the Koromogawa fortress to flee even deeper into friendly territory. It was in the immediate aftermath of the fort's fall that a famous episode from the war is said to have occurred involving the new Abe chieftain Sarato and Minamoto no Yoriyoshi's son, Yoshie. According to legend, Sarato was attempting to flee the battlefield, but Yoshie was hot on his heels, determined not to let the Abe leader go. Yoshie called out mockingly after Sarato, Koromo no yakata wa horobi ni keri. The seams of Koromo Fort have split apart. This was not just any old jeering remark, as Yoshie had phrased it in the style of a traditional poem, and made a play on the fact that the word Koromo can also mean clothing in addition to just being the name of the fort's location. Just as most of us today would not have caught on to the intricacy of this insult, Yoshie also probably did not expect this provincial hillbilly to be well-educated enough to comprehend his wittiness, but to his surprise, Sadato responded without missing a beat. Toshio heshi ito no midare no kurushisa ni. An old thread cannot help but fray with the passage of time. Sadato's response was also made in poetic style, being in the 575 meter that was a perfect match to Yoshie's initial 77 stanza, and carrying on with the pun on the double meaning of Koromo. Yoshie was deeply impressed by the skill of this riposte, and suddenly seeing Sadato as a worthy adversary, he chose to slow his horse and allow him to escape to fight another day. Now, did this ancient Japanese rap battle actually take place? No. Probably not, but it's an iconic moment in Japanese history, and it's a rare admission by the pre-modern mainstream narrative that the Abe clan may not have actually been the barbarians that the Minamoto made them out to be. In the roughly 10 days following the capture of Koromogawa, the Kiyohara Minamoto army captured several more Abe forts, and their morale seems to have been through the roof. Yoriyoshi is even recorded as having distributed all the alcohol stored in the fallen Kinomi fort among his men in celebration for their string of victories. The Abe had at last been pushed back to their final stronghold, the Kuriagawa fort, which was located right around here in what is the modern city of Morioka in Iwate prefecture. You can actually see that the shrine right behind me is literally dedicated to the names of Abe no Sadato and Abe no Muneto. Kuriagawa Fort was a well-defended base, ordered on one side by the Kitakami River and equipped with caltrop-filled dry moats and a string of watchtowers. Moreover, the fort's defenders seem to have been in surprisingly high spirits, with both the Abe warriors and their wives and mothers recorded as having enthusiastically jeered the attacking army from behind the fort's walls. By the third day of the siege, the Kiyohara Minamoto army had lost several hundred warriors without making any significant progress, and at last they resorted to the strategy that had worked for them so well at Koromogawa, fire. They stacked dry grass and pieces of wood around the outside of the fort and then set them ablaze, and a conveniently strong wind quickly caused the fire to spread. Caught between a rock and a hard place, the Abe warriors charged forth from the fort's burning gates to make one last valiant stand, but they never really stood a chance, and before long, they'd been defeated. Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo, our old friend with the Abe wife who had abandoned the Minamoto cause back at the war's outset, was dragged before Yoriyoshi and beheaded slowly with a deliberately dulled blade. 
Abe no Sadato was also brought before the Minamoto general, who raged at him about his treasonous actions. But Sadato, having been mortally wounded in the fighting, is said to have simply glared at Yoriyoshi and then drawn his final breath. Perhaps unsatisfied at having been unable to sufficiently exact revenge on Sadato, Yoriyoshi then had the late Abe leader's 13-year-old son put to the sword. With this, the once powerful Abe clan of Mutsu was broken. As was customary following the defeat of traitors and rebels, big air quotes there, by the way, the heads of the most prominent Abe family members were carried to Kyoto to be publicly displayed for all to see. Humiliatingly, the heads were carried by one of the Abe clan's surviving retainers, and an anecdote remains that this man called out for someone to provide him with a fresh comb so that he might tidy up the hair of his late master, Abe no Sadato. The nearby imperial officials, however, scoffed and mockingly suggested that he use his own personal comb for the task. Ultimately, the despondent retainer did just that, all while weeping tears of shame at the prospect of having to straighten his master's hair with his own unworthy and, in his words, filthy comb. From a modern perspective, this anecdote honestly just sounds really weird on a whole bunch of different levels, but it offers a cool window into the culture and value system of early medieval Japan. In the aftermath of the fighting, Kiyohara no Takenori was appointed general of the Chinjufu, the pacification and defense headquarters, by the imperial court, this being the first time that such an appointment had ever been given to a native denizen of northern Japan. Yoriyoshi himself, having accomplished his mission, took a new appointment as governor of Iyo province, but he remained in Mutsu for the next year or so to keep a wary eye on the Kiyohara. With their mutual enemy gone, a mild friction seems to have emerged between him and the Kiyohara over what to do with the surviving members of the Abe family, specifically the remaining sons of Abe no Yoritoki, of which there were several. The Kiyohara appear to have been planning to re-establish the Abe in the back six districts, with their new leader, of course, being one of the late Yoritoki's Kiyohara-descended sons. But this plan clashed with the will of Yoriyoshi, who wanted the Abe completely removed from the local political scene. Yoriyoshi would ultimately get his way, essentially kidnapping the remaining Abe sons and taking them with him to the capital, from where he convinced the imperial court to have the men sent into exile in his own new province of Iyo, no less. With their plans for an Abe puppet government dashed, the Kiyohara were forced to instead send one of their own into Mutsu to assume direct control of the back six districts, and this ended up being the newly appointed Shinjuhu general, Kiyohara no Takenori. Still, this wasn't exactly a bad deal for the Kiyohara, as they now had one of the most profitable regions in Mutsu to add to their already lucrative stomping grounds in Dewa, a collection of three fertile districts known as the Semboku region, giving them a level of power and wealth heretofore unseen among the local clans of northern Japan. In order to legitimize their control over the back six districts, a marriage was arranged between Kiyohara no Takenori's son and the Abe widow of Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo, allowing the Kiyohara to establish at least some semblance of a blood claim to the Abe's old territory. Interestingly, this Abe woman, whose name has sadly been lost to history, was allowed to bring with her the small son whom she and Tsunekiyo had conceived together, and her new Kiyohara husband agreed to raise the boy as his own. Little did the Kiyohara know that, by adopting this little boy, through whose veins flowed the blood of both the fallen Abe and the warrior branch of the Fujiwara, they were unwittingly sowing the seeds of their own doom. Unlike the Abe, who concentrated their power within the nuclear family, the Kiyohara seemed to have exerted influence over the Dewa region with a slightly looser coalition style of management, in which they utilized marriage ties and extended family connections to mobilize the province's other powerful clans. Exemplifying this well is the fact that even Kiyohara no Takenori himself was not actually his family's official leader, that role being held instead by his older brother. However, because of the Kiyohara family's more relaxed power structure, Takenori was able to operate somewhat independently of his brother and was thus also able to enjoy the fruits of his victory over the Abe as his own personal rewards, rather than needing to pass them up the command chain. 
Similar to the Abe, however, the Kiyohara were described in the Mutsuwaki as having been a family of Emishi chiefs, natives to the Tohoku region in other words, although they did not officially serve as district managers of their home base of Dewa's Semboku districts. The spot from which I'm speaking to you now, by the way, a site known today as Otoriyama, is thought to have been the location of the Kiyohara clan's headquarters within the Semboku region. The most prominent theory regarding the origin of the clan's family name, Kiyohara, is that they obtained it in the 9th century from the governor of Akita Castle, a man by the name of Kiyohara Mahito Yoshimochi. Yoshimochi was a high-ranking officer in the Imperial Palace Guard, and he made his way out to Dewa province in the late 800 CE to help suppress an Emishi uprising known as the Gangyo Rebellion. Once the rebellion had been put down, Yoshimochi took over command of Akita Castle and remained in Dewa to help tune up the province's military system and make sure that more rebellions didn't break out in the future. A key way to do this was, naturally, to enlist the aid of powerful members of the local Emishi population and get them on the side of the provincial government. And indeed, it was the Emishi of the Semboku district who had been instrumental in helping Yoshimochi and his comrades to put down this rebellion in the first place. While we have no way of knowing for sure, it is not too much of a stretch to imagine that a tight bond was formed between Kiyohara no Yoshimochi and the local people of the Semboku area, and that this bond led to one of the powerful families in the area inheriting his name. Without veering too far into the territory of speculation, it is also worth considering the possibility that Yoshimochi may have fathered a child with a daughter of one of these powerful local families, and that such a turn of events could have led to the inception of the Dewa Kiyohara clan. With the conclusion of the former Nine Years' War, peace briefly returned to northern Japan. The years passed, and many of our key characters began to shake off their mortal coils as the younger generation rose up to take their place. Minamoto no Yoriyoshi, who had already been in his early 60s at the time of the war's outbreak, passed away in 1075 at the ripe old age of 87, having attained just about all the wealth and glory that an ancient samurai could have hoped for and lived out his last few years as a Buddhist priest. Back in the north, control of the back six districts passed from Kiyohara no Takenori to his son, and then eventually to his grandson, a man by the name of Kiyohara no Sanehira. By the time of Sanehira, his branch of the Kiyohara clan, riding high off the prestige which they had won by wiping out the Abe, had come to serve as the clan's premier leadership line. Now, Sanehira's father was the man we discussed a few minutes back, as having taken one of the surviving Abe women, Fujiwara no Tsunekiyo's widow, as his wife. And while Sanehira himself had predated this union, he had two younger brothers to whom this woman had given birth. The first was her child with Tsunekiyo, whom the Kiyohara clan had agreed to adopt, the boy we met earlier as Fujiwara no Kiyohira, who was now an adult and was going by the name of Kiyohara no Kiyohira. Technically, he didn't have even a single drop of Kiyohara blood in his veins, but thanks to his mother's remarriage, he had become an official member of the Kiyohara clan, and a fairly exalted one at that. The second brother was named Kiyohara no Iehira, and he was the biological child of this Abe Kiyohara union, making him the half brother of Sanehira on his father's side and the half brother of Kiyohira on his mother's. Perhaps unsurprisingly, these three tenuously related Kiyohara brothers do not seem to have had the tightest relationship in the world. From family leader Sanehira's perspective, middle brother Kiyohira was a total outsider whom his family had taken in simply out of the goodness of their heart, and youngest brother Iehira, while technically being a legitimate member of the family, had his pedigree tainted by his Abe blood. Kiyohira also likely felt little in the way of brotherly love for his siblings, as they were, after all, the grandsons of the man who had destroyed his real family and treated his poor mother like a war prize. Even Iehira was probably a maelstrom of mixed feelings, finding entitlement in his Kiyohara heritage, but also feeling disconnected both by age and by status from the much older Sanehira. This cold and slightly tense relationship between the three brothers was further complicated by the ironic reality that Sanehira had no biological children of his own, and had instead adopted a son from a nearby allied family with the intent of making this young man his heir. As part of the plan to raise the Kiyohara clan's stature, Sanehira had arranged for his adopted son to marry the granddaughter of a local power holder in Hitachi province to the south. 
This young woman was special in Sanehira's eyes, not just because of her family's power, but also because she was in fact the illegitimate daughter of none other than the late Minamoto no Yoriyoshi, who had begotten her while passing through Hitachi on his way to become governor of Mutsu some three decades prior. For Sanehira, whose clan held the utmost of influence in Japan's northern backcountry, but had next to no sway at all in the imperial court, wedding his heir to a Minamoto daughter, even an illegitimate one, was an extremely attractive prospect. This soon-to-be-wedded couple is going to disappear from our narrative momentarily, hence why I have not bothered with their names. But their wedding feast has the unfortunate honor of being the backdrop for the breakout of our story's second great conflict, the later Three Years' War. As preparation for this banquet, a steady stream of guests bearing food and other gifts had been flowing into Sanehira's residence, which, by the way, is thought to have been located around where I am right now, in the modern city of Oshu in Iwate Prefecture. One of these guests was a man by the name of Kibiko no Hidetake, who was a proud but elderly warrior who had served as a division commander in the Kiyohara army 20 years prior during the former Nine Years' War, and he arrived at Sanehira's estate bearing a beautifully lacquered tray piled high with gold dust. He presented himself before Sanehira, kneeling down to the ground and holding the tray out before him, but Sanehira managed to somehow not take notice of him, being too deeply focused on a game of Go that he was playing with a close confidant. Hidetake, despite being well on in years, was forced to hold this strenuous and uncomfortable pose indefinitely as he waited to be noticed, and when the physical strain and social humiliation finally grew to be too much, he dashed the tray to the ground and stormed out of Sanehira's compound. Remember, the Kiyohara clan operated as a sort of loose family coalition, so Sanehira was not so much an absolute overlord as he was the first among equals, meaning that the bonds of loyalty between him and his lower-ranking kin were hardly set in stone. The offended Hidetake gathered up his followers and began to make his way back to his home territory, and he's said to have done so in full battle regalia, as if daring Sanehira to stop him. When Sanehira finally learned what had happened while he was off in his own little world, he became furious and began making preparations to go after Hidetake with his own army. And for the first time in 20 years, Mutsu's back six districts began to echo with the sound of soldiers marching once again. The tale of this fateful Go game, sparking war between Sanehira and Hidetake, absolutely smacks of fiction, and all signs point to it being an embellished legend. In reality, it's suspected that the true cause of their fallout was the marriage arrangement between Sanehira's adopted son and Minamoto no Yoriyoshi's illegitimate daughter. Neither bride nor groom had any real blood connections to the Kiyohara clan, meaning that within a generation, clan leadership would fall into the hands of a pair of complete outsiders, a fact which had likely sparked dissension among the ranks of the clan's powerful members. This theory is supported by the fact that, upon returning to his home turf, Hidetake contacted Kiyohira and Iehira, requesting their allegiance, and the two men readily agreed. As explained earlier, each man had his own reasons to find Sanehira distasteful, but more than anything, it is thought that they too had taken issue with Sanehira's succession plans. As Sanehira marched into Dewa to attack Hidetake, the two younger brothers cooked up a scheme to assault the unsuspecting Sanehira's base in the back six districts while he was gone. Sanehira's residence was nearby to a village called Shirotori, the inhabitants of which were all peasant farmers who worked cultivating his land, making the village an important cog in his income stream. Kiyohira and Iehira swept in with their warriors and razed some 400 of the village's homes, dealing their older brother a strong and unexpected economic blow. Hearing the news, Sanehira turned his army around in an attempt to engage the two younger men in battle, but they managed to avoid him and flee. At just this moment, as the back six districts were falling into chaos on a local level, an important new development was about to take place on the provincial level, as the imperial court had just appointed a new governor for Mutsu province. This new governor was none other than Minamoto no Yoshiie, who as you will recall was the son of Minamoto no Yoriyoshi and the man who popped up in that famous poetry exchange after the battle of Koromogawa Fortress. Yoshiie had actually served briefly as governor of Dewa province immediately after the former Nine Years' War, but he had transferred out of the job quickly, possibly due to the aforementioned friction between his father and the Kiyohara over how to deal with the Abe clan's survivors. Now, after 20 years, Yoshie was back in the north, and knowing his reputation, Kiyohara no Sanehira quickly put his inter-family war on hold and set about entertaining the new governor. Sanehira prepared a great banquet for Yoshie and showered him with the sort of lavish gifts that only the north country could provide—horses, gold, eagle feathers, seal skins, and the like. 
Once he was confident that he had won Yoshie over to his side, Sanehira once again turned his attention to his disobedient relatives and began marching his army back out toward Dewa province. Seemingly unconcerned with the return of Minamoto no Yoshie, Kiyohira and Iehira yet again launched an attack on Sanehira's home base, this time sending warriors to assault his residence itself. The residence actually seems to have been well guarded and well equipped to stave off a military strike, but Sanehira's wife still chose to send a messenger to Yoshie requesting backup. Initially, two of Yoshie's subordinates who were on patrol in the area came running to the scene, and a little later Yoshie himself arrived with a large band of warriors to join the fray. He is said to have sent a runner to Kiyohira and Iehira's army, giving them an ultimatum, basically saying, you know who I am, I don't think you want to do this, now is your chance to retreat. At first, the two brothers seemed ready to accept this advice and pull back their troops, but ultimately one of their relatives convinced them otherwise. Battle was joined, and just as Yoshie had warned, the two brothers proved to be no match for the Minamoto warriors, finally being forced to pull their troops back and break off the attack on Sanehira's home. Just as Kiyohira and Iehira were probably beginning to sweat uncomfortably about their choice to make an enemy out of Yoshie, they were greeted with a shocking piece of news that would offer them a conveniently timed get out of jail free card. Sanehira, their elder brother and enemy, had died suddenly while on the march on Dewa. None of the ancient documents give a specific reason for Sanehira's death, simply using the word tonshi, which indicates an abrupt and anticlimactic demise, but in a world nearly a millennium removed from the advances of modern medicine, it's not hard to imagine any number of unexpected health issues which could have claimed the clan leader's life. Having lost any reason to continue fighting, Kiyohira and Iehira presented themselves before Yoshie and officially surrendered, crossing their fingers that the Minamoto governor would accept their capitulation and be willing to let bygones be bygones. Yoshie reacted even more magnanimously than the brothers had expected, forgiving them unconditionally and going so far as to divide up control of the back six districts between them, completely ignoring the late Sanehira's adopted heir, by the way, and relegating him to a historical footnote. While on the surface it may have seemed that Yoshie was simply acting as a just and benevolent governor here, in reality he had created the perfect conditions to begin sowing the seeds of animosity between the brothers. You see, when Kiyohira and Iehira had received three districts each to control, Iehira had clearly received the short end of the stick in terms of quality, as his districts were far less agriculturally bountiful than Kiyohira's. From Iehira's perspective, Kiyohira was not even a real blood member of the Kiyohara clan, so it irked him to no end that he should receive half, let alone the better half, of their family's territory in Mutsu. Iehira soon embarked on a smear campaign against Kiyohira, repeatedly slandering him to Yoshie in hopes of getting the governor to reassign their territory. The plan completely backfired, however, as Yoshie's only reaction was to scold Iehira for his immaturity and continue his preferential treatment of Kiyohira. Finally, in a hilariously bold move, Yoshie forced Iehira to literally move in with Kiyohira and reside in his home, ostensibly in the hopes that turning the brothers into roommates would somehow reawaken their sibling bond. Obviously, all prior signs pointed to this being a plan that was only going to make things worse rather than better, and it is for this reason that many scholars believe Yoshie was intentionally stoking the brothers' animosity in the hopes of triggering a war between them. Sure enough, Iehira finally reached the limit of what he could tolerate, and he sent some low-ranking samurai to assassinate Kiyohira in their now-shared home, the former site of which I am speaking to you from now. Kiyohira managed to notice just in time that something sketchy was about to happen, and he stealthily slipped out of the residence and hid in the garden, where he was forced to wait helplessly as Iehira's henchmen murdered his wife and child and set fire to the building. Following the attack, Kiyohira went running to Yoshie to inform him of what had happened, and Yoshie immediately set out with several thousand warriors to punish Iehira for his actions. This whole incident can be interpreted in a couple of different ways. First, there is the good faith interpretation, in which Iehira was the villain, Kiyohira was the victim of a senseless tragedy, and Yoshie was simply the responsible governor who quickly sprang into action to right a grievous wrong. Then there is the more conspiratorial interpretation, which sees Iehira less as a villain than as a hot-headed fool who was duped into throwing the first punch in a fight which would only benefit his enemies. In this interpretation, Kiyohira and Yoshie were in on the plot together, 
with Kiyohira seeing it not only as the perfect excuse to go to war with his half-brother, but also as a chance to cut ties with his adopted clan by getting rid of his Kiyohara-affiliated wife. Yoshie's quick action after receiving Kiyohara's report reinforces this theory, as it almost seems that Yoshie had been already prepared to march out and that he was just waiting for the expected go-ahead. Either way, with Yoshie's troops on the move, the second major phase of the later Three Years' War had begun in earnest. Having failed to kill his older half-brother, Yehira fled Mutsu for his clan's original home turf of Dewa, where he and his followers holed up in a stronghold known as the Numa Fort, or Numa no Saku, which was probably located right around here where this shrine stands today. The fort was large enough to accommodate a large host of soldiers, and it was surrounded by a network of friendly villages that were willing to cooperate in keeping it well stocked with provisions. Yoshie and his army laid siege to the fort, but they were unable to completely cut off its supply line, and the standoff dragged on from summer to fall and finally from fall to winter. Just as the morale of Yoshie's warriors was beginning to decline purely out of fatigue and frustration, they also began to be pummeled by a round of heavy snowfall, and suddenly they found themselves fighting just to survive in the harsh winter climate. Yoshie's army contained a great deal of warriors from central Japan, as this was the heartland of the Minamoto clan's influence in the Middle Heian period, and these men were not at all accustomed to the Arctic conditions of northern Japan during this time of year. At last, Yoshie's army devolved from a proud fighting force into a sad mass of vagabonds huddling together and eating their own horses out of desperation, and they were forced to retreat back across the Ou Mountains and return to Mutsu. Battle may never have been joined, but still, Yehira had, in his first real standoff against Minamoto no Yoshie, managed to come out with a victory. Hearing of Yehira's success, his uncle, Kiyohara no Takehira, came galloping in from Mutsu to join his cause, praising him for having brought glory to their clan by repelling such a renowned foe. Takehira suggested that they abandon the Numa Fort for an even more formidable stronghold, the Kanezawa Fort, slightly to the northeast, and Iehira readily agreed to the plan. Iehira, however, was not the only one to gain a new ally as back in Mutsu, Yoshie was surprised by the sudden arrival of his younger brother, Minamoto no Yoshimitsu, who had discarded his post in the Imperial Guard Corps to come support Yoshie in the war. At the scene of their reunion, a teary-eyed Yoshie is reported to have told his younger brother that seeing you now is as if seeing our late father come back to life. With you fighting by my side, the heads of Iehira and Takehira are as good as ours. Still, Yoshie did not make any immediate moves, waiting out the spring and summer before finally setting out in the ninth month of 1087, with an army that is said to have numbered in the tens of thousands. The Kanizawa Fort, which once stood where I'm sitting right now, was known for being a formidable stronghold, and its defenders are said to have been roughly a numerical match for Yoshie's own troops, meaning that the battle ahead was sure to be another close contest. Numerous famous anecdotes remain from this phase of the war, one of the most famous being the story of Yoshie seeing through a planned Kiyohara ambush in the wilderness around Kanizawa by noticing a flock of geese break formation as they flew over a suspicious patch of tall grass. Yoshie supposedly acquired the knowledge to make this judgment thanks to his knowledge of Sun Tzu's art of war, which he had studied in the capital after the former Nine Years' War under the tutelage of the famous aristocrat and scholar Oe no Masafsa. Masafsa had apparently taken the young Yoshie under his wing after hearing him regaling other aristocrats with war stories one day, war stories which seemed to have impressed the other listeners but which revealed to the learned Masafusa just how ignorant Yoshie was in the matter of classical military tactics and strategy. If the anecdotes are to be believed, then by the time of the later Three Years' War and the Battle of Kanizawa Fort, Masafsa's teachings had made Yoshie into a much better commander, although we are still talking about the same guy whose troops were literally eating their own horses at the previous siege, so who can really say? One new tactic which Yoshie is said to have employed in the siege of Kanezawa Fort was a system for motivating his own warriors by personally evaluating their performance in the fighting around the fort's walls. Each evening, 
he would host a banquet wherein several warriors would be invited to sit at the gonoza, the seats of the brave, and several would be invited in to sit at the okunoza, the seats of the cowardly, with these designations being based on how they had conducted themselves in the battle that day. I have to imagine that these dinners were extremely awkward, but with Yoshie's soldiers primarily being samurai who were in this war more by choice than by obligation, the system seems to have functioned pretty well. Yet another famous anecdote from the siege of Kanezawa is the tale of a warrior who I doubt ever sat in the seats of the cowardly, a 16-year-old lad by the name of Kamakura Gongoro Kagemasa. At some point during the siege, Kagemasa is said to have taken an enemy arrow in his right eye, with the arrow piercing all the way through to the other side of his neck, penetrating the backside of his kabuto helmet and pinning said helmet to his head, all while somehow not actually causing any life-threatening damage. Kagemasa managed to enlist the aid of a fellow warrior to help him get the arrow shaft out of his skull, but in his eagerness to provide assistance, this warrior ended up planting his foot on Kagemasa's face to secure extra pulling leverage. Now, if you've ever been to Japan, you will know that just entering someone's home with your shoes on is a major faux pas, so you can imagine that putting your blood-spattered, mud-caked footwear on someone's face is not the best way to get on their good side. At this affront, Kagemasa flew into a rage and attempted to stab his comrade, screaming that, I don't mind dying on the battlefield, but if I have to spend another waking moment with your foot on my face, then we're both going to meet our makers. Thankfully, the warrior managed to dodge Kagemasa's blade, and after carefully defusing the situation, he switched over to using his knee and managed to safely extract the arrow. Despite the best efforts of Kagemasa and the thousands of other tenacious warriors just like him, Yoshie's army just could not seem to make any progress toward bringing down Kanezawa Fort. Yoshie realized that it was time for a change of strategy, and rather than attempting to take the fort by strength of arms, he resolved that he would instead switch over to playing the waiting game and attempt to starve the defenders out. This idea was actually suggested to him by Kimiko no Hidetake, the grumpy old warrior who had sparked this whole war by throwing the tray of gold dust in Kiyohara no Sanehira's yard several years back. We don't really have much information on what Hidetake had been doing following the death of Sanehira, but his reemergence here indicates that he ultimately chose to side with Kiyohira over Iehira after the brothers split, and that he was lending his services on the battlefield to the anti-Iehira cause. Speaking of Kiyohira, he is recorded as having been in charge of one of the four wings of the army that was surrounding Kanezawa Fort, but there are mysteriously few mentions of him in contemporary chronicles of this phase of the war, so all we can really say is that he was there and he was participating. Anyway, after a number of days of inaction following Yoshie's choice to switch over to starvation tactics, a messenger arrived in the Minamoto camp from Kanezawa Fort, suggesting that they arrange a bout of single combat between the two armies' best warriors to stave off their boredom. Yoshie agreed to this proposition, and sent a warrior by the name of Onitake to engage the Kiyohara champion, a man called Kametsugu. In a scene slightly reminiscent of Hector and Achilles' final showdown during the Trojan War, the two men met in the shadow of Kanezawa Fort's walls and fought fiercely with Naginata as their respective armies cheered them on. Finally, Onitake managed to swing his polearm with just the right timing to cleanly take off Kamitsugu's head, bringing the contest to a decisive end in the Minamoto side's favor. Not wanting Kametsugu's head to be taken as a prize by the enemy, a mob of Kiyohara horsemen stormed out of the fort's gates to retrieve it, but this just triggered a countercharge by the adrenaline fueled Minamoto onlookers, and before anyone knew it, a full on free for all had commenced. The impromptu battle ultimately ended in favor of the Minamoto army, with the Kiyohara forces taking heavy losses thanks to their rash decision to leave the safety of Kanezawa Fort's walls. This chaotic melee would ultimately prove to be the final real battle of the later Three Years' War. From this point on, the Kiyohara made no further attempts to launch any attacks against the Minamoto, and the Minamoto likewise stuck patiently to their strategy of starving out the Kiyohara. But this doesn't mean that the passing days were completely uneventful. On one occasion, a follower of Kiyohara no Takehira, known to us only as Chito, ascended one of Kanezawa Fort's watchtowers and began loudly shouting insults at the Minamoto from afar. Yoshie, your father couldn't beat the Abe clan on his own, and so he got on his knees and begged us to help him. And if we hadn't said yes, there's no way he would have won. You owe us everything, and yet you repay our kindness by bringing an army against us. There's a special place in hell for disloyal traitors like you. 
Hearing Chito's words, Yoshie is said to have calmed his furious followers and bade them not to respond to the provocations, but he did make an ominous remark hinting about now having an interest in seeing Chito captured alive. Despite what one might guess from this incident, the defenders of Kanezawa Fort were hardly feeling confident in their situation, and a sense of creeping unease was settling over them as they watched their supplies dwindle further and further. Kiyohara no Takehira, who by now seems to have been the senior decision maker in his partnership with Iehira, began making multiple attempts to send messengers into the Minamoto camp and arrange a surrender on terms that both sides could find agreeable. While Yoshie's younger brother, Yoshimitsu, seems to have been open to these talks, Yoshie himself was thoroughly uninterested, and Takehira was ultimately forced to abandon any hope of a peaceful resolution. Desperate to reduce the number of mouths they had to feed, Kanezawa Fort's defenders at last made the decision to expel their wives and children from the fort, assuming that the Minamoto army would allow the non-combatants to leave the area peacefully. This assumption, sadly, proved to be mistaken, as when the first of the women and children attempted to pass by the Minamoto camp, Yoshie ordered his warriors to massacre them without mercy. While there is no arguing the degree of cold-bloodedness that had to be required to give such an order, Yoshie's intention here was to force the people not yet caught in the attack to flee back into the fort, and thus ruin the Kiyohara's plans to reduce their food burden. Indeed, the terrified survivors frantically scrambled to return to the safety of Kanizawa Fort, so Yoshie's strategy, inhumane as it was, did indeed pay off. While the lengthy siege had been taking a grave toll on the Kiyohara, it was also beginning to wear away at the Minamoto army as well, as fall had all but ended and northern Japan was beginning its first steps into another typically merciless winter. Around midnight on the 14th day of the month of Shimotsuki, the 11th month by the old Japanese calendar, Yoshie is said to have suddenly and confidently proclaimed that tonight Kanezawa Fort will fall. He awakened one of his squires and had the boy run around the army's camp, instructing the Minamoto warriors to set their shelters aflame as they would no longer need them tomorrow and they could warm themselves by the heat. We have no way of knowing why Yoshie made this prediction. Did he have an informant within the Kiyohara ranks? Was this story simply embellished by later authors wanting to burnish Yoshie's legend? But either way, it proved to be true, as within Kanezawa Fort, Iehira and Takehira were in the midst of preparing a mass escape from their stronghold. The fort's defenders set fire to the entire complex and attempted to slip out into the wilderness while the Minamoto soldiers were still rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. But thanks to Yoshie's shrewdness, the Minamoto army was already prepared for battle, and they charged into the fleeing defenders and began cutting them down left and right. Kiyohara no Takehira was discovered trying to hide in a pond inside the fort and was dragged before Yoshie to face the general's judgment. He pleaded for his life, and Yoshie's brother, Yoshimitsu, once again showed his merciful side by remarking to Yoshie that it was bad form to kill an enemy who had already surrendered. Yoshie, however, countered that Takehira had not surrendered at all, having merely been captured against his will, and he promptly ordered him beheaded. Also captured alive was Chito, the bold instigator who had hurled insults at Yoshie from atop the fort's watchtower, and he was subjected to, shall we say, a very 11th century fate. After having his tongue and teeth brutally ripped from his mouth, he was tied to a tree branch and left to dangle just above the severed head of his late master, Takehira. Yoshie strung him up in such a way that his feet could indeed reach the ground, but if he let them do so, he would end up stepping on Takehira's head, subjecting the Lord Vassal Pair to the highest degree of humiliation. Chito is said to have struggled valiantly to hold himself aloft, but ultimately his strength gave out and he was forced to tread on his former liege. The final person of note on the Kiyohara side, Iehira, actually managed to escape the killing fields disguised as a peasant and travel quite a ways away from Kanizawa Fort, but he ended up running into a Minamoto-aligned local power holder who recognized him and killed him on the spot, sending his head to Yoshie in exchange for a reward. With the fall of Kanizawa Fort, the later Three Years' War had at last drawn to a bitter and blood-soaked close. Yoshie penned a letter to the imperial court requesting a retroactive imperial order for the destruction of the Kiyohara, as such a document would legitimize the conflict and make him and his warriors eligible for a reward. After examining all the facts, however, the court concluded that the war had been nothing more than a personal vendetta by Yoshie against Kiyohara no Iehira, and that Iehira had posed no actual threat to the government and people of Japan. 
Upon receiving this judgment, an embittered Yoshie is said to have unceremoniously discarded the heads of Iehira and Takehira by the side of the road, there no longer being any need to display them in the capital. The court had also elected to assign a new governor to Mutsu, a thoroughly aristocratic one who was unlikely to instigate any more wars, and so Yoshie turned his back on the snow-covered northlands he had spent so many years fighting across, and at last made his way back to Kyoto. Left high and dry by the court, but still wanting to compensate his followers for their years of service, he dipped into the vast Minamoto family coffers and rewarded all of his warriors out of his own pocket, in the process cementing his legend as a noble commander who looked out for his troops even when no one else would. Ironically, the court's refusal to officially recognize the legitimacy of the later Three Years' War created a golden opportunity for Yoshie to forge bonds with his followers that existed on a purely personal level. Yoshie had ceased to be a middleman for government rewards, and had instead become the very source of those rewards, offering his followers a new, alternative target for their loyalty, and in the process reducing the importance of the imperial court in the eyes of the average samurai warrior. These warriors had now spent the last two generations fighting epic conflicts under Minamoto generals on their country's wild and far-off frontier, and the legends and tales of valor born out of these wars would go on to be cherished for centuries as badges of honor by their participants' descendants. These descendants would look back on these conflicts through heavy nostalgia goggles as shining examples of how the world of the warrior ought to be, illustrating everything from battlefield conduct to the ideal relationship between a lord and his vassals. In this sense, the former Nine and later Three Years' Wars created the dynamic between the Minamoto and the lesser samurai families of Japan that would one day allow the Minamoto to unite those families under their leadership and establish the country's first shogunal government at the close of the 12th century. If you're a subscriber of this channel, though, I'm sure that is a story with which you are already familiar. When the Minamoto army had dispersed and the dust had settled, the last man left standing in the ravaged Tohoku region was Kiyohara no Kiyohira, heir either by blood or by adoption to both of the North's great fallen clans. Despite this, control of northern Japan did not immediately pass into Kiyohira's hands, as the central government eyed him with a great deal of suspicion as a rabble-rouser and co-conspirator of the warmongering Minamoto no Yoshie. Still, having been through all the tumultuous things he had in his 31 years of life, he pushed forward in spite of the circumstances and worked to re-establish his position as an important local figure. He married a female relative of the late Kiyohara no Takehira in order to reunite the divided remnants of the family, and he also worked to open up relations with the Fujiwara regent family in the capital by gifting them a pair of fine northern horses. He even spent several years living in the capital himself, partly to escape the chaos of the post-war north, but also partially to make connections and further educate himself on aristocratic culture. Around the tail end of the 11th century and the very beginning of the 12th, Mutsu province hosted a number of governors who were particularly lenient toward and cooperative with the local leadership class there, and it was during this period that Kiyohira seems to have at last returned home. Armed with his powerful new connections in the capital, Kiyohira worked under these governors as both their administrative and military right hand, and within a few years he had established himself as an indispensable local ally to the governor's office. Eventually, the central government rewarded him for his years of hard work by appointing him Mutsu's Oryoshi, its director of military and police matters, and by officially granting him domain over Mutsu's back six districts. By this point, Kiyohira had changed his family name from his adoptive clan's Kiyohara back to his biological father's Fujiwara, a move which allowed him to break free somewhat of the baggage that his adopted name carried and assert his genealogical connections to the esteemed Fujiwara warrior line. Reborn as Fujiwara no Kiyohira, he relocated his base of operations to Iwai District's Hiraizumi, which I'm speaking to you from now, and he set about transforming the area into a cultural oasis unlike anywhere else in the Tohoku region. The focal point of his efforts was a temple complex he began construction on known as Chusonji, which he crowned in his final years with the Konjikido, a hall of the Buddha Amitabha coated from corner to corner in brilliant gold leaf. At a ceremony to celebrate the complex's completion in 1126, a 71-year-old Kiyohira is said to have read aloud from a lengthy written dedication statement in which he included the following passage. 
this temple's bell shall echo uniformly throughout the world, washing away suffering and bringing relief to all who hear it. Since ancient times, both warriors of the court and warriors of the Emishi tribes have laid down their lives in great numbers on this land, their bodies joining those of the innumerable birds, beasts, and fish who have come and gone here. The souls of those once living pass into the next world, and their bones turn to dust. But whenever this temple bell chimes, I pray that it will bring peace to the spirits of all those who have needlessly lost their lives here and lead them to heavenly paradise. Kiyohira's true motives during the later Three Years' War will probably remain a mystery to us forever. Did he conspire with Yoshie to exact revenge on the enemies of his father and grandfather? Or was he simply a battered survivor forced to live through a crucible of tragedy before fate would finally permit him to walk his own path? Whatever the case, by the time of his twilight years, Kiyohira truly seems to have come to look back on the war with a sorrow unfettered by earthly allegiances, mourning the loss of ally and enemy alike and praying for the sake of everyone that such carnage would never again be visited on the land he called home. And that, my friends, is the story of the former Nine Years and later Three Years Wars, two of the most important and yet also mysterious conflicts in the history of the samurai, and indeed the entire country of Japan. As promised in the intro, before we go, I do want to take a minute to touch on why both these wars bear names that do not accurately reflect how long either of them actually lasted. The former Nine Years' War began in 1051 and continued until the latter half of 1062, making it nearly 12 years in length, and the later Three Years' War ran from the summer of 1083 to the winter of 1087, making it close to five years in total. So what's the deal? Why are these wars needlessly selling themselves short? Well, the answer is not entirely clear, but we have a couple of very reasonable theories that explain the issue. In the centuries immediately following both events, the former Nine Years' War was actually referred to as the Twelve-Year Oshu War, Oshu being an alternate name for Mutsu Province, and the later Three Years' War didn't even have a standardized name, simply being referred to with various clunky iterations of that war that Yoshii fought. Many scholars suspect that at some point during the Middle Ages, the Twelve-Year Oshu War name came to be mistakenly interpreted as an overarching title for both wars, and that medieval audiences thus divided these twelve years between the two conflicts, assigning nine to the former and three to the latter. When we look at the actual phases of both wars in which sustained fighting was carried out, these numbers, while not perfect, look like they could have some logic to them, as both wars have relatively long periods of inactivity which do indeed shave years off of their lengths when removed from the equation. When examining medieval documents, however, it becomes clear that this division into 9 and 3 didn't happen simultaneously, as the 13th century epic Hogen Monogatari, for example, refers to the two conflicts as having been 12 years and 3 years respectively. As the later Three Years' War was particularly important to a lot of medieval samurai families as a key component of their family mythology, it is believed that there was a strong demand for the war to have a standardized name, and the later Three Years' War moniker was thus settled on by Kamakura period warriors in order to satisfy this demand. Cutting out all the internecine fighting at the war's start, the actual period in which Yoshie was fighting against Kiyohara no Iehira was a little less than two years, and it has been theorized that the three-year designation was cooked up as a mild embellishment to make this sound a little better. The slightly less than two years war doesn't sound very epic after all. By the 14th century, the former Nine Years War also seems to have transformed from a 12-year conflict to the nine-year one that we are familiar with today, indicating that the aforementioned arithmetic accident likely took place sometime either in the mid to late Kamakura period or the early Muromachi period, as a byproduct of the later Three Years War getting its official name. If you've been left a bit confused by this explanation, that's, that's okay. The bottom line here seems to be that everyone is confused, and pretty much has been since the Middle Ages. And that confusion, along with a possible dash of boastful embellishment, has led to the slightly misleading pair of names that we have today. Anyway, it's about time that we finally get around to wrapping up this video. 
This was my first time going on location and filming at real historical sites, and I've gotta say this is probably the most fun I've ever had since starting this channel. All the places I've visited are within a roughly 3 hour drive in one direction or another of where I live, so it's been really cool for me to get to take you guys on this little tour of the region of Japan I've been calling home for the last 7 years. Northern Japan is still one of the least visited parts of this country, probably because you have to get away from the tourist friendly safety net of big central cities like Tokyo and Osaka, but if you're up for a little adventure it's absolutely worth the visit. The abundance of nature and lesser known traditional culture and the fact that it doesn't have that sort of theme park atmosphere of some of Japan's more touristy destinations makes it, I think, a really rewarding place for anyone with a genuine interest in the country to come to. That being said, don't don't all come at once. I mean, that non-touristiness is a fragile thing, so you know, let's let's maintain a healthy balance here. Then again, if you're watching this video and you've made it all the way to the outro here, well, you're probably the kind of person who would make a lovely tourist. So disregard everything I just said, and please come on up. And if you happen to spot me at some countryside karaoke bar, sipping some potato shochu and singing old bump of chicken songs, don't forget to say hi. That's all from me though. As always, thanks for watching, have a great day, and I'll catch you guys next time. Who <laughs>